All right, greetings, friends. My name is Lucas Mann, and uh, I'm, I'm the pastor of uh, Poplar Springs Baptist Church in Ware Shoals, or one of the pastors there. And um, I come out here this evening with uh, the sole purpose of making the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ known to you, myself, and uh, a few friends of mine. Uh, come from different areas of the state, different towns, but we're united under one banner. Uh, and that banner is that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Jesus Christ is the King of glory. And we come to proclaim His gospel message, His good news, that He Himself has died on behalf of His elect, that He has died on the cross for sinners, and that He is alive today and forevermore. We do not come out here bringing uh, a news uh, that is somehow trumped by any other message. We, we do not come out here proclaiming a king whose rule is somehow in conflict with any other king's rule. Rather, we know that the gospel message is the power of God. It is the saving message, the only true saving message. The gospel message is exclusive. It is not something that... Um, that can be altered or can be changed. It in its pure essence cannot be changed. And so we come out here preaching it from the Bible. We do not come to tell you things that we believe as personal opinions. We come to you to tell you that the Word of God has spoken, that God has given us revelation in the Scriptures, in the 66 books of the Bible that comprise the story, the story above all of the stories, the greatest story ever told. The story of Christ's redeeming work on behalf of His people. We come out here also to, to, in light of this truth, call you to repentance and faith in this Redeemer. Uh, dear friends, we do not come out here to beat you down, but to nonetheless plead with you to turn from your sins and to, sir, you, you yourself have to repent and believe upon the Redeemer. Jesus Christ, my friends, saves from sin. He has saved me from my sin. Saved me from my hatred of my fellow man, from my addiction to pornography, my, my love for the things of the world, my filthy mouth. Christ has saved me from those things. And many of you are, unfortunately, you, you are swept over your sin. You, you are, um, as it were, swimming in the sea of iniquity. And many of you do not know the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are slaves to your sin. You are not slaves of the living God. However... Jesus Christ Himself said, If the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus came to set sinners free. And many prosperity gospel preachers will interpret that as, uh, and, and they'll say that He's come to set us free from difficulties in this life, from financial constraints, uh, from, from fa familial difficulties. But rather, my friends, Christ has come to set sinners free from sin, from the result of sin, that being hell, and even the power of sin in this life. Uh, Christ has set me free from those things. I was once a, a false convert, someone who claimed to be a follower of Christ, like many of you are, but however, I was a hypocrite. I, I, was, I was steeped in sin and thought myself to be one of God's people. But I was desperately lost. I was deceived. And many, uh, many of you, my friends, I know are in that same state. And Christ came to save even you. Christ came even to save hypocrites. Those who would claim to be followers of the living God, yet do not know Him in truth. And I know that that would describe many of you here this evening. And what is the remedy for such? It is true belief in the gospel, not just a professed faith in the gospel, but true belief in the fact that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost, as Paul wrote. Uh, we know the angel told Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, he told him that he shall call his name Jesus, which is in Hebrew, Yeshua, Yahweh saves, for He will save His people from their sins. And that He has done, that He has done through His atonement upon the cross. There's a specific passage that I would like for us to consider this evening, for, I'd like for us to look at together. Is It's found in 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is a, is a concise explanation of the truth of the gospel. It's, a, it's, a, it's an exposition of Christ's saving work by the Apostle Paul. And I'll actually start in verse... Um, I'll start in verse 16 to give a little bit of context of chapter 5. Paul writes this, he says, Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, 
who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Us meaning Paul and the apostles. This is what Jesus' own apostles preached. This gospel message that he explains. He says, verse 20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. Again, referencing what I just said. As though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. In verse 21, he writes, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And that is, in, the, in its very essence, the gospel message, that double imputation, as it were, the fact that Christ took upon His very shoulders the sins of all of God's people, and in return, they received His imputed righteousness. And these are concepts that are often, unfortunately, especially here even in America in this day, in this post-Christian culture, they are foreign to many of your minds. The idea of sin and righteousness and imputation and an alien righteousness. These ideas, we don't even have a concept anymore. Perhaps a few generations ago, there would have been more of an understanding of these ideas, but it's been lost. And so that's why it's all the more necessary that we come out here this evening, myself and my brothers with me, to proclaim to you these truths, to explain them so that you yourselves may have saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many of you, unfortunately, who will go on to destruction for lack of knowledge. You will go on to hell for lack of knowledge of the Redeemer. And that's why it is so imperative that we come out, that we proclaim this truth. Our Lord Jesus even, even told us to do this. He commanded us in Matthew 28. He said, go into the world and make disciples of all the nations. And what is, you could say, the first step to becoming a disciple? What is a disciple? It's a, a follower of Christ, someone who believes in Christ. How can we make someone a disciple if we do not tell them about the Christ whom they are to follow? We cannot. This God and this King, if you do not know Him, surely you will be destroyed by Him on the day of judgment. But we know, however, He offers in His grace today to receive everyone, every, every person, male, female, rich or poor, unto Himself if they merely will come, turning from sin and turning to Him, believing that He Himself is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him. And Paul and the Apostles preach that as evidenced by this particular passage at hand. In fact, there's nothing as important in your entire existence when compared to understanding the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what your eternity will be staked upon. This is what determines your eternal destiny. Whether or not you have believed in the Son of God, whether or not you have uh, turned to the Lord Jesus Christ in saving faith. There are many, unfortunately, who have this knowledge, yet they turn from it. They do not believe it. And for them, the day of judgment will be a fearful thing. It will be a, a, a terrifying thing for them. Scripture tells us it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It truly is. It truly, it truly is. Now, I want to read a passage out of John 3 to really illustrate this point about belief in the Son of God. Uh, Jesus says in John 3, this is Jesus speaking in verse 18, he says, He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds are evil. Dear friends, there are many of you who turn from the truth of the gospel even at hearing it, though it is precious and glorious, because not that the gospel was ill-explained or the fact that the gospel is not of itself hard to validate. Rather, it is because of your love for sin. My friends, many of you, as I mentioned earlier, are the slaves of sin, but Jesus Christ sets sinners free. Repent and believe the gospel, and Jesus will have mercy. Jesus will have mercy upon all those who humble themselves under His mighty right hand. Hello, how are you doing? Good, it's good to see you. In fact, Jesus continues in John 3 there. He says in verse 20, For everyone who does evil 
hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed at the heart of man's rebellion against the gospel. And lack of faith in the gospel is pride. The fact that he does not want his evil deeds, he does not want his sinful lifestyle to be revealed, to be a public spectacle as it were. He doesn't even want God to see it. He wants to hide it from God. That's why so many people run from Christianity and run from any mention of true religion. It is merely because of the fact that they have sin. But listen to what Jesus says, verse 21. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. And that is our hope this evening, my friends. My dear friends, I call you that not because I necessarily know you, but because I care for you as a friend would a friend. And my friends, I want you to know that that is why we're here this evening, to make the truth of Jesus Christ known so that you will embrace Him, that you will come to the light of the world. This world is a dark place, my friends. This world is a very dark place. In fact, I, I read a, an article uh, just yesterday about a woman who had had many abortions. She had killed many of her children. And she said the reason being she didn't want to bring a child into this miserable world. That's a pretty scary and, and, and sobering thought. but. Oftentimes our perspective of this world is the fact that it is filled with darkness and pain and hardship. And it is, truly it is. However, the light has come into the world to give hope, to give eternal hope. Not a hope that is merely for this life, but for the life to come, for life and eternity. And it's that hope that we want to make known this evening. So going back to 1 Corinthians there in chapter 5, Let's look at that there. In, in, uh, beginning at verse 21, at the beginning of verse 21, Paul writes, He, and this is speaking of the Father, of God the Father. And this is, this is referencing the fact that God had a plan. The, the, the death of Jesus Christ, the coming of Christ into the world, was not some, uh, we could say, emergency plan that God came up with last minute. It wasn't something that uh, even uh, that, that Jesus had not expected. Rather, this was something that had been in the mind of God for all eternity. This was the preordained plan of God. In fact, Scripture talks about Jesus as the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. It speaks of His atoning work and its efficacy even before the created order was set in place by God in the book of Genesis. So he says, He, that is the Father's activity in the ministry of Christ, He made Him who knew no sin. The Father sent the Redeemer, the Lord Christ, into the world. He who was without sin came and dwelt in a sin-filled creation. My friends, we look at the world around us and we see that it is inundated with iniquity. Especially our, our deranged culture, the, the, the filth of American culture is a good, uh, we could say, exposition of the fact that the world that we live in is so imperfect, so far away from being perfect. And why is that? That's because we all had a father, the father of the human race, Adam. He sinned in the garden. God gave him a challenge, as it were. Uh, he gave him a test and he failed. He sinned against God. And so with his sin, not only did he himself and his wife fall, but all mankind, all of creation even itself was corrupted. That's why we have disease and decay and pain and murder and envy and strife and jealousy and all the things that we look at as evil and wicked. They are here because of the fact that Adam sinned in the garden. But God in his forbearance had already planned to sin the second Adam, the last Adam as it were. And that is Christ, who performed much better than the first Adam did. Jesus came in and was, what does Paul say? He says, he knew no sin. It's not that Jesus was ignorant of sin, but rather he knew it, in, not, not in the way that we know it. He did not know it the way that we know it. We know it, why? We know sin by experience, because we ourselves have done it with our very hands, and our very minds and hearts. We've sinned against God. Even you have, sir. And you need forgiveness through Jesus Christ. It's the only hope for you, sir. I don't want you to go to hell. I want you to be saved and be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. He spilled His blood for people who are nasty people, who are murderers and adulterers and selfish and prideful and homosexuals. He shed His blood for people like that. He shed His blood for someone as wicked as I am and as evil as I am. I don't come out here preaching to you from a pedestal as it were, no pun intended, me standing upon a stool. But my friends, I don't come out here preaching to you as if I'm better than you. I openly proclaim I'm worse than you. I'm, I'm a more evil person than you are. I've done horrible things. But I have a great Savior. I have a great Redeemer. 
And He lives. He died. He rose from the dead. And He is seated at the right hand of God in heaven. And He will cleanse you of your sins as He has done mine and give you the hope that does not perish. An imperishable hope, as it says in the Scripture. So Christ knew no sin. But listen to this. This is so significant. These very simple words the Apostle uses. He says, to be sin on our behalf. In other words, Christ became sin for us. In other words, He bore our sin upon the cross. See, it's not that Jesus sinned. It's not that for God to have saved humanity, saved sinners, He had to break His own law. He had to transgress His own law. We know God is holy and just and perfect and righteous. And He's jealous for holiness, jealous for justice. God does not break His own law. He does not contradict His own character. The foundation of His very law. We know that God does not do that. So Jesus did not come and in saving mankind, sin. He did not. That's not what Paul is saying here when he says he sin, became sin on our behalf. Rather, what he means is that upon the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ was treated as a sinner. He took the treatment that we deserve. He took the, the punishment that we deserve to be poured out on us. He took the wrath of God that we deserve to be poured out on us for all eternity in hell upon His own shoulders. See, because of our sin, my friends, we have earned for ourselves the infinite, holy wrath of God. And that's why hell exists. It's a place where God uh, gives to the wicked what they deserve, gives them this infinite punishment for their sin. But Jesus Christ comes and steps in the place of sinners and bears upon His own shoulders the infinite wrath of God, the infinite punishment, and satisfies it. Uh, we know that the Lord Christ declared as He was upon the cross in His dying moments, He said one simple word, to tetelestai, that is, it is finished. In other words, the payment has been paid. Uh, my friends, when you accumulate a debt, it is only natural that you pay that debt back. And that is similar to the way sin works. When we sin against God, there is an accumulation, as it were, of debt. There's an accumulation before the throne of God, and that debt must be paid off, either by ourselves in hell, or it has already been paid off by the Redeemer, the Lord Christ. And He did that perfectly for His people. In fact, I want to turn to the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah 53, verse 4, it says, Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed. My friends, even when we scurned the Son of God, as it were, even when we, when we looked upon Him with hatred, Christ lays down His life for sinners. In fact, even on the cross, He prayed for those who, who were persecuting Him, saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Many people look upon Jesus, and they look upon Him with contempt, and we wonder why, because He was such a gracious Lord. I mean, could you have the grace and the patience and the mercy to look upon those who were crucifying you and pray to God that they would be forgiven? But the Lord Christ did that very thing. In verse 10 of Isaiah 53, and this is significant in and of itself because this passage was written seven centuries before Jesus was born. But it says, But the Lord was pleased to crush Him, putting Him to grief. If He would render Himself as a guilt offering, he will see of his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Christ pleased the wrath of God. As it says in the beginning of verse 10 there, the Lord was pleased to crush him. In other words, for all of those who would ever believe in Jesus, there's not a drop left of God's wrath to pay for or to take upon themselves. Christ has sufficiently paid for it all. And that is the hope of everyone who is Christ. And that's the hope that we, we pray and we plead with you to have this evening, that you would put your hope in Christ, that you would not put your hope in your religious duty. You would not put your hope in a church or in the Pope. There's no hope in the Pope, my friends. If anyone's keep, kept up with the news recently about the Roman Catholic Church, there's clearly no hope in the Roman Catholic Church. 
It's corrupt. Even the Pope himself is the very essence of Antichrist because he says he's the head of the church when the Bible says Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Don't put your hope in men. Don't put your hope in Joseph Smith or, uh, or in the writings of Charles Taze Russell and the Watchtower and Bible and Tract Society. Don't put your hope in these things, my friends, or in the Eastern Orthodox Church because they will not save. In fact, uh, I love how the old hymn puts it. It says, Not the labor of my hands can fill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. What that saying is basically that nothing, nothing that you and I can do could possibly suffice to save ourselves. In fact, that's, that's exactly why Christ had to come into the world. If salvation could be attained through law-keeping or through religious duty, then Jesus Christ's coming was a vain coming. It was in vain. But we know Jesus did not come in vain. He came because it was absolutely necessary. It was imperative that Jesus Christ come into the world. But let's go back to the passage at hand in 2 Corinthians. He says, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that, now listen to the other part of this verse, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And what this is referencing is the fact that Jesus Christ not only came to die for sinners, but Jesus Christ also came to fulfill the law for sinners, to, to fulfill all righteousness. We see it at the baptism of Jesus when He tells John, we, I must be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus came to live the life that He lived those 30 plus years in obedience to the law of God so that He might fulfill it because we could not fulfill it for ourselves. I mean, we just consider the commandments of God, the Ten Commandments. You shall not lie, you shall not steal, you shall not commit adultery. Just a few of them. I mean, have any of us actually, truly, fully, properly kept these laws? No. I mean, just that first one, you shall not lie. I am sure every one of us here has told a lie before. And even the smallest transgression is a great sin in the eyes of God. Or even adultery. There's an example, and you say, I haven't committed adultery. Well, Jesus came along later in the New Testament and said, if you look with lust, in other words, if you have sinful, lustful thoughts, sexually impure thoughts, that those things right there, that's adultery. So God not only looks at the outward deeds, He even looks at the inward man. He looks at the thoughts, looks at the thoughts of the heart. And you know what He sees? Some people say, oh, well, God looks at my heart and He knows my intentions are okay. You know what God sees when He sees your heart? He sees that it's wicked. Disney will tell you to follow your heart. But you ought not follow your heart. The Bible says your heart is deceitful. You are deceitful. You're your greatest enemy. I'm my greatest enemy. My friends, what we must do is we must turn from that. We must turn from our own hearts and trust in Jesus Christ who will purify our hearts, who will change our hearts. In fact, the Old Testament, we know God promises in the New Covenant to take out the heart of stone and to give His people a heart of flesh. In other words, to remove their hardness of heart to remove their hatred of Him and give them a love for Him and a love for His law and His truth. But going back to the keeping of God's law, Jesus did that with the utmost precision throughout the entirety of His life. In fact, He challenged those who, who opposed Him in His earthly ministry. He said, which of you convicts me of sin? And you know what? They replied with silence because they could not convict the Lord Jesus Christ of any sin. He was utterly perfect in His performance, in His keeping of the law of God, and that was with purpose. Because in, in salvation, when someone comes and they believe upon Jesus Christ, not only are their sins forgiven, but they are counted as if living Christ's life. They are, they are, they are given the robe of Christ's righteousness with which to be clothed before the throne of God. God sees them as having fulfilled everything that Christ fulfilled in His life. In fact, the Father proclaimed from heaven audibly at the baptism of Jesus, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Can God say that about any of us? My friends, you need a righteousness that's not your own. You need someone else's righteousness and you need Jesus' righteousness. The only suitable, the only fitting, the only pure, 100% perfect righteousness with which to be clothed for the day of judgment. So that when God looks at you, He sees Christ. Because on the cross, when He looked at Christ, He saw you. That's the great exchange of the Gospel. 
Christ takes upon His own shoulders my sin and I get His righteousness imputed to me. All of grace. And I did nothing to do this. God did the work for me. God did it on my behalf. That's the beauty of the Gospel. It's so unique. The Christian religion is so unique. It is different than every other religious belief in the world because every other one says man must do this, this, and this to be saved. When the Bible says it has already been done in Christ, Jesus Christ has accomplished the work of salvation already, and what you must do is believe upon it, is, is turn from your sinful ways and embrace Him. And He promises to receive you unto Himself. Jesus said at the end of Matthew 11, He said, Come to Me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He invites those who are weary and heavy laden to Himself today who are weighed down by their sin and their guilt knowing that they deserve hell. They deserve to be tormented day and night for all eternity in the unquenchable flames of hell. He invites those to come and have life eternal because He Himself suffered so that His people would not have to. He died on the cross so that sinners would not have to die eternally in hell as it were, but rather that they could have life eternal in heaven, that they could dwell with God forever. In fact, we look at the universe, we see the vastness of the universe, the, the beauty of creation. In fact, the scientists have estimated that the closest star to, the, uh, to, to our, our star, our own home star, uh, the sun, is about 4.2 light years away, which is such, a, such an unimaginably large a distance. In fact, it, we really can't comprehend its vastness. And that's just the closest star to us. There, there, there's billions and trillions of stars in the visible universe, and that's just what we can see. There's more universe, the scientists estimate, but beyond the known universe. And we see that, and we see the grandeur and the majesty and the power of God and the fact that Genesis tells us God spoke and all of those things leaped into existence. God spoke and the, the stars themselves set themselves in their orbits. The, the, excuse me, the planets set themselves in orbits. And the stars put themselves in the sky right when God spoke and commanded. That's the power of God, my friends. We ought to fear God. God is to be feared with, with reverence. With, scripture talks about trembling before God. It's because it is a fearful thing to fall into His hands. But if you have Christ, and Christ has you, if you are one of Jesus' sheep, you need not fear the Father. You need not fear God. Because God has saved you. Because God has sent His Son to die for you. And to accomplish your eternal redemption. This righteousness is something that is received as a gift. In fact, if you insist on receiving Christ's righteousness through your own works, if you insist on being saved by your own works, it will not work. It will not work. You must be saved merely one way. There's only one way. It's a narrow way. And it's faith alone in Christ alone. It's to the glory of God alone that it is in such a way. In fact, around 500 years ago, five centuries ago, we had one of the biggest events in all history, and that was the Protestant Reformation. A man by the name of Martin Luther pinned his 95 Theses to the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany, and, and protested against the Roman Catholic Church, which at the time was saying, if you want to be saved, if you want to be forgiven, you've got to perform religious duty. You've got to buy indulgences. You've got to be involved in church activities. And Martin Luther, rightly understanding the Bible, says, No, wait. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, It is by grace that we are saved through faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Young sir, even though you're young, you still are called to believe upon the Redeemer. To come to Christ in saving faith. And He'll save you from your sins to His glory. And so there's, a, there's an urgency with what we're saying. There is an urgency because we don't know, none of you know when your last day will be, when you will breathe your last breath. In fact, uh, it's been estimated that around 150,000, 160,000, somewhere around there, give or take 10,000, people die every single day. That's a lot of people. A lot of people. And I'm sure that you, maybe a family member or a friend, you've, you've witnessed them one day were, they were one day here and then the next day were gone. We do not know when our life will be taken away. Scripture talks about our life being like a vapor of smoke. It appears for a moment and then it's gone the next. My friends, and if your life is not being lived to the glory of God, if your life is not being lived as a life in saving faith in Christ, belief in the Redeemer, my friends, it's a vain life. It's a waste of a life. Please do not waste your life 
Do not lose your soul for your sins. Do not waste your life away on sinful pursuits and vain things. There are so many people, my friends, so many dear, precious souls in this very city that are wasting their time away and wasting their, their life on things that are so vain and so meaningless. Many of you perhaps have come here this evening to entertain yourselves with the various events and the, and the different activities that are taking place under these tents. And I think that's great. This is a great family event. And I praise God that you're all here. But my friends, many of you come here with the intention of wasting your life away even more so. My friends, even while you're here today, turn to Christ and live. And let your time be redeemed by the Son of God. Scripture talks about time in such a way that gives us the impression that it is precious and that's because it is. And we know that from its very nature that once time passes, once time is gone, it cannot be regained. Once something has taken place, it cannot be taken back. And many of you, my friends, have lived lives of sin up until this point. Sin-filled sin lives, just like I did before I was one of Christ's sheep, just like I did before God saved me, lived in adultery, and pornography addiction and drugs and drinking and cursing and setting before my eyes things on television that God hates and God detests. Many of my friends, many of you my friends are likewise in that very lifestyle. And it's you've wasted your time up until this point. But Christ comes even today through his word and says, in effect, your time can be redeemed. What's left of your life can be used for good, for the glory of God. The villain, as it were, can become one of the hero's people. He can be under the very hero of the story who is Christ Himself. And that's why we come out here saying that if you perceive yourself as someone who is exceedingly sinful, then your perception is correct. However, there is no sinner who is too much a sinner for Christ to save. In fact, I mentioned earlier, I, I perceive myself to be a greater sinner, a, a worse sinner than you are. But here I am today having been saved. Not perfect, but changed. Given new direction in life and hope for eternity that when my life ends, which it will one day, and I'll die and be forgotten, yet I know that I'm Christ and Christ is mine and forevermore will dwell in heaven. We'll dwell in heaven. I will worship. I will glorify God for all eternity, my friends. And this is what you ultimately, mankind's been created to that end. Uh, we know the, the Westminster Shorter Catechism as well as the London Baptist uh, Catechism, or the, the Baptist Catechism, excuse me, both say, what is the chief end of man? And man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him. God bless you, man. Glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's the end to which we've been made. We come out here not only to say, oh, repent of the things that you've loved and you've enjoyed and just live a life of, of, of hard drudgery, as it were, and just be a religious person who's upset all the time and has a frown on their face. We come out here to, to call you to enjoy the living God, to delight yourselves in the Lord, and He'll give you the desires of your heart. And you will not be let down, as it were. In fact, I love what Paul says in the book of Titus. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. The apostle, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, writes, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus who gave Himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession, zealous for good deeds. Indeed, we say with the Apostle, the grace of God has appeared. You know, my friends, in the Old Testament age, during the time of the, of the Kingdom of Israel, there was hope that the Messiah was going to come. The testimony of the Old Testament Scriptures all the way from Genesis 3.15 to the end of Malachi clearly in unison declared that there was coming a Redeemer. There was coming Mashiach who would save His people from their sins. However, they did not know His full identity. And they did not know the full scope of what Christ would come and do. And my friends, we live in this time and in this day, post-New Testament era, where we know with certainty who the Redeemer is, what His identity is, and what He did down to specific details so that our faith can be even more sure than theirs was, as it were. 
My friends, do not think lightly of God Himself. I've exhorted you not to think lightly of your time, but I also exhort you to not think lightly of God because the character of God is so majestic and so wonderful. But it's also fearful. God is a, is a God who is to be feared because He is holy and infinite in justice and has wrath. Many people, even Christians unfortunately, or people who say they're Christians, are uncomfortable with the idea that God is wrathful. Many people understand, oh yeah, God's love. We believe that. We know the New Testament says God is love. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, and clearly we find God is love. We know God is gracious and merciful, but when we get to the other attributes of God, like His holiness, or His hatred for sin, or His justice, all of a sudden we become uncomfortable and we want to ditch those ideas and those concepts. Do you know why that is? It's because we're idolaters. And we want to make a God who suits our own lustful desires. We want to make a God in our own minds and hearts who suits us, and who, th who gives a, a big thumbs up to our sin. But that's not the God who is the God of glory or the God who upholds all creation, who gives you life in every breath and every step that you take out of His mere grace and mercy. That's not the true God. We must go to the Bible to recognize and to see and to realize who is this God? Who has created the world? Who has made me? And we find that it is the God of Israel. It is God. It is Yahweh to use His personal name. It is the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one in three, three in one. The God who has been and who forevermore will be, who is infinite in power, justice, holiness, goodness, and truth. And this is what Christians throughout the ages have believed. And when we take His holiness and His justice lightly, when you take God's wrath lightly, that God is a wrathful God, then you're committing idolatry. When you flat out reject those things, you're certainly then committing idolatry. And when, you re and when you do that, you reject the testimony of Scripture. For the testimony of Scripture is unified that these attributes of God are truly His attributes. In fact, look at what we see in Psalm... In Psalm chapter 11 and verse 4, it says, The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked. And the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Well, that's a message that we're not going to hear a lot of times, especially in churches, right? In these seeker-sensitive churches here in Greenville. Like redemption. Churches like that are like the um, New Spring churches. You won't hear that in those churches. You won't hear a verse like this read. But my friends, we have to tell you the full counsel of God. We have to tell you what everything in the Bible says. And this is there. That those who sin, God has hatred for. In Psalm 5, just a couple of Psalms back, verse 5, it says, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all those who do iniquity. But my friends, that, we tell you that with trembling and fear on your behalf, but we don't leave you there in a hopeless state because we know that Jesus Christ saves sinners. Jesus Christ saves sinners. That's the Gospel message, my friends. That's the greatest news, the greatest story. And you say, That's, that doesn't sound great. It's because you're not recognizing that you're a sinner. And not just, oh, well, I am a sinner, but I am the chief of all sinners. I am the sinner of sinners as it were. I'm the ringleader of all those who commit atrocities against God. And I deserve His judgment. God bless you, man. Thank you so much. But when we recognize our spiritual poverty, we see the value, the preciousness of Christ, and the glory of the Gospel. Uh, the, the Gospel is called in the New Testament the Gospel of the glory of God because it reveals to us His weightiness, His beauty, His majesty. It reveals to us that God is not like we are because I don't think any of us could possibly conjure up such a wonderful message, such a wonderful method of salvation that God's own Son, His only begotten Son would, would be crucified, would be pierced and be hung upon a tree as it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree as Paul says in Galatians 3. But that through that means, through, through that act of divine love and mercy, the salvation of the world would be accomplished. But that is what has happened to the uttermost. 
In fact, we God gave us four accounts of the life of Jesus and of the death of Jesus and of the resurrection of Jesus. And I think that's, a, that's significant because God wanted the readers of the Bible to walk away with this, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that He is Savior, and all of the Bible is about Him. In fact, all of the creation of the world is to redound to His glory. That's the end to which we've been created, to glorify God, to redound to the glory of God. And our lives, if they are not being used to that end, they are vain. So my friends, we say give God the glory for the great things that He has done in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Give God the glory for the great things that He has done. That's what the old hymn says. O come to the Father through Jesus Christ the Son and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Truly He has. But if you, being entrusted with this knowledge, choose to, to turn away from it, to let it go, to let it slip between your fingers as it were, and not to grab hold of it, then there is only a fearful expectation of the wrath of God that will consume His enemies. In fact, Jesus in His first advent came with grace and tender mercy and compassion to save sinners. But in His second coming, Christ will not come in such a way. He will come to bring vengeance, to bring wrath. Listen to what it says in Revelation 19, one of the last chapters of the entire Bible. It says, verse 11, John is writing here. Listen to what he says. He says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. My friends, on the day of Christ's return, it will be a fearful thing for the wicked because they'll be recipients of His wrath. But know that in His first coming, He came in grace to lay down His life in grace. And the offer is being held before you today, as it were, to come and to freely have eternal life at no cost to you, at no cost to you whatsoever. Free eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord to His glory. And many of you scoff at that precious truth, but it is glorious and it is precious. And if it's not to you, it's because you have not understood your sinfulness. You haven't understood, as the Apostle Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. I am the sinner of sinners. And my friends, you must grasp that. You must grasp your, the fact that in light of God's perfections, in light of God's holiness and justice, you are a sinner. And that you deserve His wrath. But Christ took upon His, upon his own shoulders the wrath of God. And so there is eternal hope for all those who will come. And there are many of you who suppress the truth of God altogether, deeming yourselves atheists, as it were, saying, oh, I, don't, I, I just don't believe in any God. I, I don't even believe that the, the, the universe necessitates the existence of God or a God. But my friends, there's no such thing as atheists. In fact, I'm an a-atheist. I'm a double negative. Because there is no such thing as, as a person who is ignorant of God's existence. In fact, Scripture talks about His existence being very clearly perceived and clearly known. And so on the basis of that, we can appeal to you and say, come to this Creator. Jesus Christ created the world and upholds it by the word of His power. So come to Him and have life freely. Many of you will try and conceive of, of many, um, you could say, well-worded arguments to, to dismantle the gospel, to dismantle the existence of God altogether, but it does not work because the very existence of creation validates God's existence. 
In fact, the Bible makes no effort to prove God's existence. It's always assumed in the Bible. Always assumed. Because we all know it to be true. My friends, my, ma'am, the Roman Catholic Church won't help you. Confession or penance won't help you. You have to believe in Jesus. He's the only Redeemer. He's the only Redeemer. There's no other Redeemer. No priest. No Pope can stand in our place. Christ is the only mediator between God and man. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. In fact, unbelief has been something that has always been around, even in Jesus' own ministry. The Son of God walking on the face of the earth itself, preaching and proclaiming and doing miracles, even in the face of that, we find that the Jewish people, for the most part, rejected His testimony. In fact, Jesus said to them in, in, um, in John chapter 5, verse 39, He said, You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about Me. And you are unwilling to come to Me so that you may have life. He says, I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another, and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote, about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Even in Jesus' own day, we have people who are filled with unbelief. In fact, the, 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 the heart of mankind, the, the, the depravity of man is so great and is so all-encompassing that the only way that someone would ever choose God or come to God is if God first chooses them. And God regenerates them. In other words, recreates them. Gives them a new heart with a new temperament, new desires, and new inclinations. This is what Jesus called being born again. Being born a second time. All of us have been born once. That's why we're here today. But we've got to be born a second time. Only not literally, not physically, but, but spiritually. We must be remade. We must be made again. Made anew by the power of God. And God is in the business of doing that. He's done it to me. He's done it to my brethren here today. He's taken us as we were before, sinful and wicked and perverted and ungodly, and has given us new hearts and new desires. Desires for that which is good. A love for His truth. And we come out here not saying that pridefully as if we were exalting ourselves, but to say God works miracles today. God is in the business of doing miracles. Not in the, to the extent that we see like in the New Testament or in the ministry of uh, Moses, but rather in terms of the soul. God changes people's souls. He gives them new desires. He changes hearts. This promise that was given through Ezekiel is being fulfilled today in the New Covenant era, in the New Testament era. God is changing people's hearts. And we trust that through the preaching of the Gospel, through the exalting of His Son in the open air, God will do that to those whom He will even here perhaps today. In fact, Jesus is always calling to Himself a people. In fact, we find in the Gospels when Jesus calls the disciples to Himself, all He says is, follow Me, and they immediately come. That's because the voice of the shepherd is so strong, is so powerful, is so effectual. The calling is so absolutely overwhelming that we cannot resist it. This grace, this irresistible grace is just that. It is irresistible. And so come, have life eternal. Jesus died for sinners. Jesus suffered. He cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He suffered agonies in His soul so that we would not suffer agonies in hell. And He rose from the dead. My friends, Jesus Christ did not die. He remained in the tomb. He is alive. He is alive today. Every other religious leader, they all die and they're in their tombs. They're in their graves. But Jesus Christ rose from the grave. You'll find no skeleton. You'll find no closed tomb. It was all rolled away and He came and He appeared to His disciples. In fact, Paul talks about in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus appearing to a group of more than 500 Christians at one time. And then after 40 days of ministry amongst His disciples, Jesus Christ bodily ascended into heaven. He bodily ascended into heavenly glory. And the Scripture says He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. 
Uh, the book of Hebrews puts it this way in chapter 1, verse 3. It says, When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. His work is complete. In the Old Testament age, in the temple, the priests always stood up because their work was continual day after day. There was no seats inside the temple because the priest's work was never completed. It was never done. And then we have Christ, who is high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He offers his own self up as the atoning sacrifice. He's raised from the dead and he goes into heaven in the very throne room of God and he sits down. He sits down as a high priest because the work of redemption is complete. There is nothing that is to be added to it. There is no additions or subtractions. It is in its essence complete and full and perfect. And he not only sits down as a high priest but as king to rule and to reign. In fact, uh, just a couple of years ago, and uh, even up to this very day, there's been a lot of controversy over our nation's current president. And that's how it always is, whether they're a liberal or a, dim or, or, or a conservative. There's often talk and, and contention in America especially over who's, who, who's sitting in this highest position in American government. But you know what, my friends? It really doesn't matter ultimately because Jesus Christ sits on throne and His throne is King. And there'll never be an impeachment There'll never be a change of office. Jesus will always reign as King. Kingdoms come and they go. America has come and it's going to go. But Jesus Christ remains. The Gospel itself remains. Christ's Kingdom remains and it's ever growing and ever expanding. He's always calling a people to Himself, a people for His own possession. And my friends, we needn't we needn't worry about this temporal world as much as we ought to concern ourselves with eternal things, with spiritual things. With our soul, our, 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 your eternal destiny is at stake, my friends. And you yourself have personal sin. Or you know what? Recently in the news there's been a lot of talk about Me Too and things about victimhood. And a lot of racial issues have been brought up in the news. But my friends, we don't, we don't need to worry about necessarily well, which, which category of victimization do I fall in? How, ma how, how many aspects of intersectionality can I quote concerning my own life? Rather, my friends, we must realize this. That it's not about if I'm a victim or not. It's about the fact that I've sinned against God and I need salvation. And Jesus Christ is the Savior of sinners. Jesus Christ is the Redeemer and He Himself promises full forgiveness and a righteousness that is not our own. A justitia alien, a Latin for a foreign righteousness, a righteousness that He Himself procured through a life of obedience to the will of God. This is what we need. This is what you need. And so I plead, I beg of you that you would come and have life eternally. Have it free. Free of charge to you. Not because God just merely and, and freely and whimsically dispenses forgiveness, but because Jesus Christ paid the inestimable price. He, he paid the price that we could not pay by shedding His own blood. Only God could, could accomplish redemption. That's why we have a lot of cults out there, like the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, that say Jesus is lesser than God or lesser than, than deity. But Jesus Christ is truly God. He is God Himself. And we know Thomas, in Jesus' resurrection, says, My God! He, he, de he declares Him to be God. We know all throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament, Jesus is revealed to be God. And it was only God who could pay for the great sins that we've committed against Him. Sir, are you forgiven? Are you forgiven of your sins before God? Are you, be, are you found in the Redeemer? Are you in Christ, as, as Romans 8.1 says? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So we ask you to take part. To have your stake with the Son of God, as it were. To be enlisted in His army of saints. To be amongst His flock of sheep. To be one of His people. To be a child of God. Kept by His hand forevermore. In Christ Jesus our Lord. I'll end with this exhortation from the end of Jude. At the end of uh, the book of Jude in chapter, or excuse me, in verse 24. Jude writes, Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling 
and to make you stand in the presence of His glory, blameless, with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen and amen.